Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 22nd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we outline the key criteria we intend to use in deciding which candidates to support this coming election cycle. Second, we discuss the potential impact on Alaska of President Biden and other countries' decisions to release oil from their strategic petroleum reserves in an effort to push oil prices downward. And third, we discuss some of the practical issues around pushing for a constitutional convention. And now, let's join Michael. We'll get things started with what you think we should be looking for what you and Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets will be looking for for endorsements of candidates coming into the next election cycle, which we've already agreed is going to be a wild ride. Uh, tell me about that. Well, Michael, I've already started getting uh, uh, contribution requests. Uh, actually, I've gotten it, it's been before now, but I've started picking up uh, steam in terms of getting contribution requests and and uh, candidates uh, uh, wanting to uh, to talk about the issues. Um, and I, you know, sat down and thought through what what is it, what criteria uh, it, it should should I use uh, this year, this coming year in terms of uh, in terms of supporting candidates, and and the one that I think is going to be uh, front and center uh, in in terms of of how I evaluate uh, candidates is going to be uh, their reaction to the working group's uh, proposal for a comprehensive fiscal plan. Um, I think there was, a, I, I, as we've talked about on the show before, I think that is a uh, a, a very good document. Uh, surprisingly so, given sort of uh, the uh, uh, the way people went into it and given the limited time they had. Uh, but I think it's a very useful document in terms of outlining a way forward. It's not fully detailed. Uh, they talk about spending cuts, but they don't talk about exactly where to make the spending cuts. They talk about revenues, but they don't talk exactly about exactly what type of revenues. And, and as we've talked on the show before, that's somewhat, I think that's somewhat important. Um, they, but they do talk about the PFD and they talk about constitutionalizing the PFD and they do talk about spending caps and they talk about constitutionalizing the spending caps. Um, and I think that is, I think that's a, that's, that's critical stuff. They talk about uh, Governor Dunleavy's compromise for the PFD, uh, POMV 5050. Uh, which, frankly, as we talked about a long time ago on the show, I think is probably more consistent because of the way it treats inflation proofing is probably more consistent uh, with Governor Hammond's vision than uh, uh, than maybe even the statutory approach. Um, and uh, and and I do think the working group just really does a wonderful job outlining uh, a, a plan that uh, that's achievable. The other thing uh, that I think is important about the about the working group plan. Is that it is it was it is created by some of the most liberal members and some of the most conservative members uh, in the legislature, and and they were driven explicitly driven when you look at the document explicitly driven by the objective of getting to uh, twenty one plus eleven uh, on uh, on on spending issues and, and revenue issues and twenty seven plus fourteen on constitutional issues. Those are the numbers, the magic numbers. Uh, in the House, it's 21 to pass a bill. It's 27 to pass a constitutional amendment. In the Senate, it's 11 to pass a bill, 14 to pass a constitutional amendment. Those are the magic numbers you have to get to. And as we talked on the show before, um, uh, given, where, given what redistricting has shown, has reminded, 
reminded us of again. Uh, Alaska is a very red state at statewide election levels because the Matsu is so red that it just gives such overwhelming majorities uh, on statewide issues. But on on legislative issues, um, uh, Alaska is very uh, purplish. Uh, uh, there's much more balance between uh, progressives and conservatives uh, at, at a statewide level when you look at it uh, legislative district by legislative district. And so I think the other thing that's important about the working group is that they they were that they focused on getting a plan together uh, that uh, that can achieve the 21 plus 11 and the 27 plus uh, right. plus 14 at least at least they think it, it can achieve that. Right, right. So 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 legislator this this time around we need I think we need legislators who are practical, who are going to work to for things that are achievable uh, in the legislature, in the legislature that we have now, and in the legislature we're going to have for the next decade. I think we need I think we need legislators who are practical and work on things that that are achievable. So, indicate uh, uh, supporting the working group plan I think is an indication also that uh, of a candidate that that they believe in things that are. Uh, are practical, putting a putting a priority on things that are practical uh, and achievable. Well, and I think you and I have discussed. I mean, you, you mentioned it briefly here that you know this working group was made up of uh, probably one of the most diverse groups of people in the legislature. And what was so shocking was that they came to a unanimous decision in the end on these priorities and what needed to be taken care of and that they stressed how important it was to have a holistic approach to this, not just taking one or two of these issues, but all of the issues had to be dealt with. They could not be taken in isolation. They needed to be taken holistically and that they all came. I mean, somebody like JKT, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, who, you know, obviously is, you know, at direct loggerheads usually with somebody like Shelley Hughes or Mike Shower, it was, in agreement on this, and they all came together. Um, I mean, it was pretty uh, astonishing that that's what happened. Only more astonishing was the fact that they were then completely ignored by the uh, by the leadership of the House <laughs> and the Senate at this point, right? Well, exactly, and I think that's why we need candidates who will step up and and it, why I'm looking for candidates who will step up and and explicitly. Uh, endorse and 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 want to achieve the objectives uh, that the that the working group uh, group set forth. I mean, yes, we do have we, we did have leadership who ignored it, and and you and I discussed on the show last week that we have a House Ways and Means Committee that uh, that's supposed to you know find the ways and means to achieve uh, things uh, in the House as opposed to pursue uh, partisan objectives, and they just they've ignored it. I mean, they've gone to. Their their bill is a twenty five seventy five PFD instead of a fifty fifty PFD. Right. So it's yeah, we need candidates. We need to elect officials who are um, who are going to go in there and uh, uh, and uh, uh, I see I just froze on here. I, who are going to go in there and uh, 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 push for uh, the working group. Right. Well, and and then I think that that should be again maybe one of the questions that we start asking the candidates that come in. Um, are you ready to? Uh, are you ready to start? Uh, you know, supporting and endorsing the working group's model. Is that something that uh, uh, you believe in? And it, just as much as you know, where do you stand on the PFD? So this should be the next. Uh, this should be the next question that we put to each candidate. I think I think it's a key question. I mean, there's 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 the there's the social policy issues that that people are going to ask about and and pursue. My focus is on the fiscal policy issues, and I think the working group gives us both on the left and on the right. I think it gives us a great test uh, of of whether candidates are serious about trying to achieve solutions. I mean, I've I've been engaged uh, recently with uh, with people who uh, believe that you know. The working group was you shouldn't have compromised. They should insist on spending cuts only. Uh, they should insist on uh, on uh, uh, only uh, uh, you know achieving objectives through uh, uh, through reducing the cost of government. Uh, and that's you know that's fine, but that's not going to work. That's that's not all. That's going to lead to is another ten years of PFD cuts because it's not going to pass the legislature. We saw that in 2019. We see that when we look when we look at the analysis of the districts. Uh, that's uh, that's come up in redistricting. It's not going to pass the legislature, and so all you're doing is you're going down a road 
that's going to continue year after year to be frustrating and, and not achieve its objective and result in uh, an additional PFD cut. So right. I, it, it, it's a great test to the working group asking about the working group and their reaction to the working group, Canada's reaction to the working group. I think it's a great test of, of not only are they interested in, 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 you know, in, in what are fiscally conservative or fiscally responsible objectives, but also uh, whether they're interested in actually achieving something in the legislature or they just want to continue to uh, to fight about it. Well, that was the point of the working group, right, was to create a compromise that everybody could at least live with. I mean, that was the point, right? It wasn't it wasn't to get uh you know, get one side's viewpoint or another side's viewpoint. They were trying to find something that they could all agree with. And I think that is the that's the important part there. And it, and if it, in, in a compromise means that not everybody that everybody is not happy, I guess, with the final outcome. Um, they're satisfied, but maybe not happy in the long run. Well, exactly. And, and but but in terms of the PFD, I mean, we've seen what the lack of compromise gets us right. The lack of compromise since 2016, when Governor Walker initiated PFD cuts, we've seen that, you know, continuing to focus on spending cuts only or revenues only, which is what the progressives have done. All that's doing is extending PFD cuts year after year after year in the absence of finding some other some other solution. Largest adverse impact on over on on Alaska families, largest overall ap- impact on the overall Alaska economy. It's just we're doing that year after year after year. Right. Um, and I think I think the 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 working group really has has snatched on to something that uh, not only is is as I say fiscally responsible in terms of balancing all the objectives and in terms of getting us on a getting us on a track uh, that uh, uh, that is fiscally responsible, but it's also achievable. And, and, you know, in the world of politics, that's, that's probably more important, a little bit more important than uh, whether it's uh, fiscally responsible, whether it's achievable. And, 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 and I, and, you know, and I take to heart uh, uh, Mike Shower's endorsement, Shelly Hughes's endorsement, Ben Carpenter's endorsement, uh, Kevin McCabe's endorsement, Mike Prox's endorsement. I take to heart uh, that, that those people uh, uh, came to the table, stepped up, uh, and endorsed uh, uh, endorsed uh, in, endorsed the product. And so it's, I, you know, I I think it is it is an important step in getting to uh, a resolution. And I'm going to look for candidates uh, uh, in this coming cycle to support candidates that 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 see it uh, that way. Right. Well, it's a it's a it's a good benchmark. I think it's a good benchmark to work off of, and uh, we should be uh, holding that uh, holding that forth as uh, as really kind of the the yardstick that we measure everything else up against. You know, I I think that this is important here. Um, you know that I I think you're right. I think that 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 working group report is probably the biggest thing uh, that came out of the last four sessions uh, for you know for sure. And it just really was a crying shame when it was all said and done um, that uh, that it was completely ignored by the entire by, by the entire leadership structure of the legislature at that point. Yeah, and and it wasn't only ignored by the legislature, Michael. Governor Governor uh, Dunleavy didn't endorse it, um, and and that's you know I. I am sure somebody's going to say, oh, he was OK with it. But that's not the same thing as getting out there and saying, OK, we finally the legislature, the, 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 the conservatives on the legislature, the progressives on the legislature have finally come to a solution. It incorporates POMB 5050. It's not perfect, but, uh, but I think it's something that's doable and it's achievable, which is uh, which is, you know, it's one of its one of its highest ranking uh, values. And, and he didn't uh, come out and endorse it. So, I, you know, frankly, when I look at governor. Uh, gubernatorial candidates. It's going to be uh, it's going to be the same question. Do you endorse the working group? Walker hasn't endorsed it. Uh, to my knowledge, Les Guerra hasn't uh, hasn't endorsed it, and and Dunleavy hasn't endorsed it. The, the 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 thing about it is its achievability. It 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 demonstrates how you get the most conservative legislators and the most liberal legislators, most progressive legislators, in the same room at the same table. On the same on the same uh, 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 agenda, there's a lot of things still to fight about. I mean, as I said, it didn't identify which spending cuts to make. It didn't identify the the, the approach of revenues. 
the approach to revenues uh, that's uh, that's part of it. Um, and it didn't identify exactly how we achieve uh, POMV. There's two alternatives in there. One is sort of the ramp up, uh, and the other is uh, is the uh, 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 the the borrowing, the the bridge loan, uh, if you will, from the ERA. Um, so there's there's plenty of things in there to fight about. But the framework, I think, is something that is a huge step forward in terms of identifying what's achievable in in a legislature that is that is purple. I mean, we just have to step up and admit that the legislature is purple, right? Um, and 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 something that's achievable in a legislature uh, that is purple, both on the Senate side and on the House side. And and so you know, let, candidates can talk all they want about, oh, yeah, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to fight for spending cuts only, and I, you know, I'm, that's how I'm going to, that's how we need to do this. They can do that, but they're not going to achieve it. And in and in and in failing to do it. Uh, we're going to continue down the road of PFD cuts and PFD cuts year after year after year. So it's the achievability, I think, that is that is as important a characteristic of uh, of that as uh, as anything else. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to number two, Brad. Uh, oil prices, you know, we're saved, right? Oil prices are going up or production or whatever, but it may not be as easy and simple as that because there's more moving parts to this than uh, than anything else. Uh, give us a tease here before we jump into the break for number two. Well, in response to uh, uh, rising gasoline prices and, uh, and the concerns about uh, inflation in general, uh, uh, President Biden today announced uh, this morning announced uh, on the East Coast uh, that uh, we're going. He's going to authorize a release of uh, uh, volumes from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve uh, in an effort to increase uh, oil pro- oil volumes in the market and uh, and have an effect on price, reduce price. Um, I'm not sure what that's going to do. We'll talk about that after the break, uh, and we'll also talk about. Uh, what it's going to do uh, to Alaska, but I think it's something that we that uh, we need to talk about and take into account. Continuing, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, weekly top three. We're on to number two, which is oil prices, which they're going to save us, or maybe they're not, or yes, they are, or maybe they're not, or the boat keeps rocking back and forth, Brad. What are we doing here with oil prices? The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is now about to be tapped. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for the future? Give us your thoughts on this before we move on to number three. Well, the, the, the issue that, that, uh, uh, that's, that's arisen over the last, uh, as oil prices have gone up, is their impact on gasoline prices and, and, their, and their general role in, in, uh, in, in pushing up inflation. Uh, that's been the issue in the United States. It's also been an issue in elsewhere in, in, in the world. Uh, India has, has had a lot of uh, uh, concerns about uh, the increase in oil prices and the effect on on their economy, Japan has had uh, uh, the same concern with respect to the uh, impact on their economy. China, uh, to a degree, has had the same concern about the impact of oil prices uh, on their economy. All uh, consuming nations, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, oil consumption, um, and so and so it's it's a it, it's become a worldwide issue. Uh, President Biden is playing into that uh, by by coordinating. Uh, a response to increased oil prices. First, it was to try to you know push back on OPEC uh, and ask them to uh, to put more oil on the market in the hope of uh, bringing prices down. Um, and uh, and and the other nations, uh, concerned nations, joined uh, in that effort to some degree. Uh, that hasn't worked. Uh, OPEC essentially said, "Nope, not us." Um, and now the administration is focusing on the Biden administration is focusing on on other. Uh, uh, ways to uh, to handle it. One of them uh, being to uh, open up uh, uh, the taps on the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, uh, America's uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and uh, put additional oil on the market uh, in that fashion. And the 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 indication is that Japan, uh, India, and maybe China are going to participate in that as well uh, by opening up some volumes from uh, their Strategic Petroleum Reserves. Uh, and putting that on the, on the market as well. It's uh, the, the early indications are it's not moving the market much. Uh, I looked at prices before I came on the oil prices today, uh, before I came on the show, and they're actually up a little bit from where they were uh, yesterday. That The market can, can swing back and forth. They may be down now, but uh, they were actually up a little bit uh, right on the heels of, uh, of the announcement. 
I think, though, uh, that if it does turn out to be a coordinated action, that if Japan and India and China also participate uh, in opening up their uh, SPRs, uh, that I think it probably will have uh, an impact on price. Now, OPEC uh, has has the opportunity to respond to that uh, by not uh, uh, making the additional increases in production over the remainder of this coming year uh, that they've scheduled. They've scheduled increases of about 400,000 barrels uh, a day uh, on a monthly basis, and they can uh, hold back on those increases uh, and tighten the market um, in that fashion. Um, so what we may be in for uh, is a period of time where oil prices are going to swing uh, significantly more uh, than they have uh, up to this point, uh, as you have sort of the push and pull of uh, of the uh, of the industrialized consumers pushing back on uh, uh, pushing back on prices by opening up their uh, uh, petroleum reserves, uh, and OPEC responding by perhaps pulling back uh, on its production levels. Ultimately. Using the spur, the spurs doesn't work very well because they aren't production sources; they're storage sources, and there's only so much in the storage. And so it's it it sort of is a is an extended period of trying to control the market by releasing from the spurs, uh, but ultimately you run out of your ability to do that. The other uh, problem is the spurs are there uh, for to deal with a truly uh, emergency situation. Right. Um, and, uh, and if you drain the spurs, uh, then in, tr in trying to control the market, you don't have them available or as available in the volumes if you have a true emergency situation. So there's some limit on, on how this goes. But I think for Alaska, what it means is a period of some uncertainty about what price is going to do uh, as we have this tug of war between uh, the consuming nations who are trying to use their spurs to affect price and OPEC pushing back by using its power uh, over production to uh, to affect price um, and in the in the in the price certainty that that we may think we see at this point as Alaskans see at this point uh, going forward over the next uh, year uh, year and a half uh, maybe uh, we may be in for a roller coaster ride as it goes uh, goes up and down. Well, again, because it does not behoove OPEC. I mean, they're making money hand over fist, and they want to balance the market slightly, but they're happy if the prices are high. So why would they want to participate at that point? You know, it's not like they're doing us any favors at that point. So, for sure. Um, yeah, and, and and the other the other effect, Michael, is it may make investment uncertain again. I mean, as price becomes uncertain and market dynamics become uncertain investment dollars, which have other places to go in the world, uh, investment dollars may become uncertain. So it, it just, it's a, it, it creates the, an uncertainty uh, that I think is uh, not very advantageous to producing uh, states like, uh, like Alaska. All right, well, let's move on to number three. The final question here, we had a long conversation last week with State Senator Mike Schauer, who believes that, uh, um, uh, that uh, the CONCON, the Constitutional Convention, is going to be one of the only ways to fix the problem that we have right now because he doesn't believe there's a political will to fix it with the working group's uh, plan or anything else. Uh, and there are other senators who have mentioned this as well. Um, I have some hesitations on the con uh, simply because I believe that it opens us up to some issues. But I think you've got some deeper issues overall with the Constitutional Convention question. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I share the issues that, uh, that that you've expressed before on the show. I mean, we've talked about it before about uh, about the uncertainty of, of uh, where it goes and the potential it could veer off into into going down a, a bad line. But but today, I just wanted to focus on the procedural aspects of it. There's a great article uh, for those that haven't read it in Alaska Public Media uh, on the Alaska Public Media uh, website. Uh, a story uh, uh, focusing on the Constitutional Convention. And I think there's some procedural issues that people haven't taken into account. For example, even if there was a vote, a positive vote on the Constitutional Convention uh, in, this election, in this election cycle, uh, the Constitution provides that uh, the election of the delegates doesn't take place until 2024. Um, so, uh, you know, people who think that having a that, that voting for a Constitutional Convention is going to immediately turn around 
uh, and, and, and have the Constitutional Convention and do whatever they think it's going to do in terms of the PFD or any other issue, uh, and then immediately uh, go out for vote, uh, are, are going to be sorely disappointed. I mean, so the process is 2022, and then the Constitution says you have uh, an election in 2024 for the delegates, and then you know the delegates meet, and if they come to an agreement, then it's 2026, or, or if the delegates take longer, uh, beyond that, before you have uh, before you have the uh, ratification vote, for those who are looking for a fix for the PFD, uh, a quick fix, uh, quick in terms of a year or two years, or uh, the the Constitutional Convention uh, doesn't doesn't give it to you. There's also, I think, some questions even whether we would have be able to have the election in 2024. The Constitution provides that the delegates would be selected in a fashion as they were as they were selected uh, in the prior. Uh, in the prior Constitutional Convention in 1955, and that elected a certain number of delegates statewide, a certain number uh, by judicial district, and then a, and a certain number by land recording district um, uh, in the state. Uh, that, uh, other than the statewide segment, uh, doing it by judicial district and by uh, a property recording district probably violates one man, one vote. Uh, the delegates were elected in the mid fifties. One, one man, one vote didn't come in until play, come in to place until the 1960s. So the delegates were elected in the old system, uh, were elected before one man, one vote was the, uh, was the, was the, the rule of the land. So, uh, I think there's probably a, a good basis for a challenge, uh, to, uh, uh, to the election system that's set up in the constitution. The constitution does provide that the legislature can establish a different system, both a a sooner election of delegates and a different system for the election of delegates. But that assumes that the legislature would come to an agreement on how to do it. And I think uh, given the divided nature of the legislature, as we've talked about before, the continued divided nature, even under redistricting, uh, I think it's unlikely to, to think that uh, that uh, uh, that would uh, that the legislature would come to some agreement on how to do the constitutional convention. So I, I see I see just nothing but a lot of delays in terms of being able to even get the Constitutional Convention off the ground, court challenges, uh, 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 perhaps the need for an additional a, a subsequent election if the first election is held uh, uh, in the manner provided uh, in the Constitution, uh, and, uh, and just a long time to go down the road before, uh, before we even get to the point where there's delegates that are considering uh, 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 you know, changing the the PFD by by a constitutional fashion. I understand. I understand the focus for you know the the pent up demand for finding a, a solution to uh, to this issue. But I think a much better avenue for using that pent up demand is focusing on electing candidates who are to go back to the first segment, who are who are committed to implementing the working groups outline of how to find this how to find the fiscal solution. I think that's a much faster, a much surer way um, of getting to the result, as opposed to you know wandering off down the down the the, the approach of a constitutional convention uh, and the uncertainties not only in the outcome of a constitutional convention, but the uncertainties and the timing of finally getting to a constitutional convention that uh, that I think we're going to face. Well, and the irony of going back to the legislature to set up a new voting uh, uh, you know a scheme. For a constitutional convention, uh, you know, the irony of that, because we have to pull the constitutional convention because the legislature won't do anything or won't come together on some of that stuff. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about a catch-22 there. I mean, that's a self-licking ice cream cone, if I've ever seen one, where they, you know, they, they, they could stretch that on for years at this point. Oh, they could. And and, and it's another 21 plus 11 issue, right? Uh, it takes 21 plus 11 to... Uh... To adopt that, and and I doubt that you have 21 plus 11 who could agree on the procedures. I mean, everybody would want to advantage the procedures to their uh, to their particular outcome, uh, and I think uh, we just find uh, a, a continued uh, a stalemate in terms of uh, looking at the legislature to solve that issue. I don't think that I, I think that those who keep calling for the constitutional convention. Um, I don't think that they appreciate the length of time. I mean, you're talking about a, between a six and a 10 year process, right? I mean, really, realistically, is that is that what you're seeing right there? Potentially so. I mean, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, I see a lot of potential because of the way that the that the Constitutional Convention or that the Constitution 
says you would select delegates in the absence of legislative action. Because of that, I think uh, it's it's ripe for litigation. Um, and as we all know, litigation can go on for a long time. So if if the litigation went on, for example, past uh, uh, the the, uh, the two year mark or the the point you needed to be able to select delegates in 2024, and it easily could, because one man one vote's a federal issue. So you could have a you could have a state suit that went to the state supreme court to decide how to do it, and then that could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, uh, you could, you can see a path where, you know, you, we can't do the election in 2024, so it has to be put off to 2026. Um, and I, it's just, maybe we don't get there. Maybe we don't get there with a working group. Maybe we don't get there with candidates who are committed to the type of compromises and the type of comprehensive solution, the type of achievable solution that the working group outlined. Maybe we don't get there. Uh, but, uh, but I think, you know, putting all your eggs in the basket of counting on a constitutional convention to, 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 to produce a result, uh, is, uh, is, is just, uh, just the wrong way to go. I mean, by that time we will have had 2026, we will have had PFD cuts in place for, right, Because they aren't going to go away while we're waiting on the, while we're right. waiting on the whole process. Everybody's going to put it off saying, oh, the constitutional convention is going to resolve that. So we will have had PFD cuts for a decade by the time we finally get out there at uh, at some point, and uh, you know, at some point, you just lose lose the momentum to to rectify PFD cuts. So I, I just people who are looking for a quick fix, I think that I think the better approach, much better approach, uh, much more certain approach, is to go down the path that the working group outlined. As opposed to you know put all put your eggs in the basket of a of a constitutional convention. Well, and like I said, that doesn't even address the issue of outside monies or outside special interests coming and trying to influence the uh, the outcome of the of the constitutional convention and you know changing fundamentally changing our constitution on top of that. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, it, there's a there's a whole bunch of other issues once you get once you finally get to the constitutional convention, but I. But I think people need to start thinking through, and the, and the and the Alaska Media article is a good place to start. People need to start thinking through the the practical, accomplishable uh, steps that are uh, that are going to uh, have to take place to to even get to the point where you've got delegates uh, delegates assembled for the purposes of of uh, of trying to draft one. I appreciate you coming on board. Thank you, Brad Keith Lee, uh, for being part of it today. As always, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me on. All right. Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming on. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.